I am going to introduce you to our first speaker, Kyle Greaves, who uh, comes to us from originally from Front Range Community College uh, with plans of transferring to the Colorado School of Mines to study civil and environmental engineering. So I will turn it over to him and Casey. I believe you're gonna share your screen and show his presentation. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Alicia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Greaves. Um, my title, the title of my project is Megacosms, a climate manipulation experiment in Green Lakes Valley, Colorado. Um, I did this in concert with my mentor, Samuel Yevac, as a part of the University of Colorado Boulder, the Niwot Ridge LTER Limnology Team, um, sponsored by Rex and the National Science Foundation. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So a little bit of background, what are mesocosms? So mesocosms are basically giant aquariums, giant terrariums. Um, we use them to simulate natural systems. We put them outside for various inputs like weather, invertebrates, and other biota that occur naturally. Um, so we use these to basically study these natural systems, such as a lake or an ocean, as you see at bottom left, with controlled variables. The variables that we are studying um, are chlorophyll A and its relationship to dissolved organic carbon. Chlorophyll A is the dominant form of chlorophyll used in photosynthesis. So when you think of plants and when you think of algae, chlorophyll A is the pigment um, that makes them green. It's what um, absorbs the largest range of light waves, the most energy. Um, and basically a measure of chlorophyll A in lakes is also a measure of the amount of phytoplankton, also known as algae. Um, it's important to measure this amount because we need to know how the planktonic food web is affecting the health of the lake ecosystem. Um, another factor that we are comparing chlorine against is dissolved organic carbon. Dissolved organic carbon, also known as DOC, is a component of dissolved organic matter, comes from soils, it comes from runoff, um, it comes from decaying plants and animal bodies. So basically, if you can look at the figure to your right, um, DOM and DOC is also a part of Earth's carbon cycle and it plays many roles within the lake ecosystem. Um, DOC is a part of total dissolved solids. Um, it helps to reflect UV radiation. It can impede photosynthesis, but it also provides substrate and food for microbes such as bacteria. Um, so as, as trees shed their leaves, as plants die, um, they form sediment at the bottom or they float within the water themselves. Um, they then are degraded into dissolved organic carbon. So why does this matter? Um, the Green Lakes Valley in the Silver Lakes watershed accounts for about 40% of Boulder Valley's drinking water. So we need to know how much chlorine is in this drinking water because there's been a lot of previous research to show that increasing chlorine levels um, has a positive correlation to decreasing water quality. Um, if there's too much algae in a lake, then it can precede harmful algae blooms. During these harmful algae blooms, there will be a proliferation of bacteria that use the dissolved organic carbon from the dead algae bodies and also the oxygen that the algae produces from photosynthesis. If the bacteria uses too much oxygen, then there isn't enough for plankton or planktivorous fish and other pelagic life in the lake. And then the lake will become what we know as hypoxic or low on oxygen or anoxic, um, little to no oxygen and can't support life. This is just a little graphic showing the food web. So all the algae over here on your right, these little green guys, they are what use the light for photosynthesis. Um, they then become food for various forms of zooplankton. Um, and then it goes up the chain in the trophic levels of the lake. On the top right, we have um, Shoshone and Magnia zooplankton. This is a picture of how we captured the plankton um, in the lakes. And then you can see a close up of them um, in the bottom right. On the left is the Shoshone, also known as copepods. We like to call them alpine lobsters because um, they look like shrimp and lobsters. And then the ones on the right are called um, Daphnia magnias. They kind of look like little fleas, little footballs floating around. Super cute. Up left, 
um, we treated we treated half of them within a group with a leaf pack. In that leaf pack, it's basically dried willow leaves from the local area um, stuffed inside of a hosiery. That is meant to leach dissolved organic matter, which then becomes dissolved organic carbon. So we're looking at if the tanks with these leaf packs have increased or decreased levels of chlorate. Um, we also have hobo loggers, which log temperature um, within a certain time frame, And then we have tiles that grow ash-free dry mass for some other studies that are going on. But our concern is how these leaf packs leach DOM or DOC and its relationship to the chlorophyll A and algae growth within these tanks. So preliminary results, I was only able to do one sampling event just because of the narrow scope of this study. Usually we do do about five or six going all the way until October, but I did want to show at least one sampling event for you guys. So if you look at blocks A and C, the first and third columns, you'll see that non-treatment tanks in the red have higher chlorate values in the treatment tanks. In B and D blocks, the results were sort of inconclusive. And then in E block, the treatment tanks in the blue actually had the highest levels of chlorate. Um, I think it's important to note that in E20, which is that last blue bar, had the highest chlorate levels of all. And we did not notice any zooplankton. So that sort of um, confirms a hypothesis that increased levels of DOC um, do cause increased levels of chlorate because as DOC is leached, I think that the bacteria used it as well as the oxygen created by the algae, created in an anoxic environment, killing off all the zooplankton and allowing the phytoplankton to flourish as the zooplankton do um, prey on the phytoplankton. And I think a little graphic in the bottom left um, is basically just a scale of um, the eutrophic levels um, of the chlorophyll A. So basically if D and E, um, if the last two tanks in D and E were lakes, they would be considered um, becoming eutrophic. Eutrophic meaning that they are, they have high levels of nutrients and a higher than normal levels of algae growth. I also ran a linear regression analysis against DOC versus chlorate in Green Lake 4. Um, we like to use Green Lake 4 as the best predictor for what happens throughout the watershed. It is the highest lake in elevation, has a true inlet and outlet that's sort of our star lake. So it's important to look at what's going on in Green Lake 4 so we can get a look at what's going on um, throughout the watershed. So if you see in the top left, um, starting at 2014, um, has a very weak correlation between DOC and chlorate. Um, and then it goes to an increasingly negative correlation. And then it goes back to an increasingly positive correlation. And then finally we end at 2019 with another negative correlation. Um, so basically I was able to determine if you look at the table on the top right with the p-values, if p-values are greater than 0 0.05, then that means that the factor that we are looking at, DOC, is not an accurate predictor for chlorine levels um, within this lake and probably throughout the watershed. So seven I don't- Seven minutes? I'm sorry, was that seven, seven minutes? Seven minutes. Okay, awesome. So key takeaways, I don't think DOC is an accurate predictor for chlorine. I think many other factors need to be looked at like pH and nitrates, but I do think that there is a seasonal peak and trough pattern as seen by the graph rather than a direct linear relationship. So I think future work could include a longer analysis over many more years. Okay, <clears throat> excellent. Thank you very much, Kyle. Kyle. And I'm just looking, let's see, to see if we have, we have time for one question. If anyone in the audience would like to ask a question. I can ask a question. Kyle, I'm um, wondering, great presentation and uh, hooray for going first. I know this is hard, you did a great job. I have a question. So you studied willows. What, and, and if you think about the watersheds, there's also a lot of um, pine needles and conifers. Do you think, how would your results be different if you hadn't um, used willows? 
Um, I am not sure. I feel like, so Diem does um, release fulvic acid. I think if we were to use a different kind of leaves within those leaf packs, um, it might either leach DOM faster or slower. Um, it might make the lake more acidic or less acidic, depending on, on the actual makeup of the leaves. Um, yeah. Great answer, thanks. Right. It's more yeah. to study. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There are a couple other questions. I'm going to go ahead and put them in the chat, Kyle, and then maybe you can answer them in the chat for everyone as we move on to the next speaker. Absolutely. 